everyone. Good afternoon and welcome back. This is day one at the Bangalore Literature Festival 2020. Our next session is a conversation with the winners of the Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay NIF Book Prize 2020. The, the New India Foundation's annual book prize recognizes the best nonfiction book on modern contemporary India in 2019. This prize is named after Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, the great patriot institution builder who had contributed significantly to the freedom struggle, to the women's movement, to refugee rehabilitation, and to the renewal of handicrafts. This year's prize is jointly awarded to Amit Ahuja for mobilizing the marginalized ethnic parties without ethnic movements and Jairam Ramesh for a checkered brilliance, the many lives of BK Krishnamenon. A quick word and introduction about our winners. Amit Ahuja is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research focuses on the processes of inclusion and exclusion in multi-ethnic societies. He has studied this with the, within the context of ethnic parties and movements, military organization, intercaste marriage, and skill and color preferences in South Asia. Thank you for joining us, Amit. Our next winner is Jairam Ramesh, a Rajya Sabha MP and was, the un and was the union minister between 2006 and 2014, holding several key portfolios, including environment and forest. He's the author of several well-known books, including Indra Gandhi, A Life in Nature and Intertwined Lives, PK Hatsar and Indra Gandhi. They will be in conversation with Manish Sabarwal, who is a trustee of the New India Foundation. With that, over to you, Manish. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, as Mohan mentioned, the New India Foundation was set up many years ago to encourage nonfiction writing about post-1947 India. Most people's history has been stopped with interest with destiny, but so much has happened over <clears> the last decade. So our original project was fellowships to write books. We have about 28 books out now. But three years ago, we started a book prize first one was Milan Vaishnav on campaign finance. The second one went to Ornit Shani on how India's first voter list was put together. And obviously, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay was, logical, was the logical person to name the prize after for everything she's done, everything she represents, and who she was. The jury had a really difficult time this year because um, it was a very strong long list. 12 books, it was a strong short list of six books. And then finally we copped out um, and we could not choose between the two of them. They were both so good that both Jairam and Amit, our stars of, of today, um, were, were declared joint winners. I'm gonna start the conversation with Amit. Um, it's very late for you, it's the middle of the night and we thank you so much for, for, for being here. But I think it would really help the audience I, I will ask you to describe your book as the second question. <laughs> I really would love to hear from you on, you know, why social movements are better at delivering welfare than politics. Um, you know, most people like me would have thought before I read your book that politics is the source of power and power is the source of delivering welfare. But the most, at least to me, the most important part of your book was that social movements are better than politics at delivering and delivering welfare. So can you just give us the answer to that question and also explain a little bit on, on, on the basic thesis of your book? Um, Manish, thank you so much. So let me just first begin by thanking the New India Foundation for this very prestigious award. I am so honored. Um, you know, I have, those were exactly my priors too. Uh, I, you know, when I began my work, uh, there you know, what, what our, our understanding in, in politics is that, that, you know, politics is about capturing power. And once you have power, then you have the ability to deliver, uh, you know, services uh, to different constituencies. What began to emerge uh, and something that, you know, came up throughout my research, uh, you know, related to the book project and also to, uh, to certain other forms of research, which is the more, you know, when I started working and, and, and doing research among the poor uh, and, and marginalized groups is that oftentimes public services are, you know, don't get delivered or have problems or concerns because of that, the last mile problem. Um, uh, there are issues of, vo so voting in, in that sense uh, happens 
interesting. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, there was a lag. Yes, okay. Yeah. So, so vote, you know, voting happens once every five years. Elections happen, people get elected, and oftentimes the poor are forgotten. Um, what I discovered through this is this capacity building that happens at the neighborhood, at the locality level, uh, through social movements. What do social movements, why, why do they help? Well, they help because they perform the social vigilance function. Um, they are able to make demands. They monitor basically lower level officials, state officials, party workers, uh, party representatives. They basically get the demands and voices out there. And you know, what is really interesting is that once people have organized at the neighborhood locality level, uh, they may have organized for reasons of the community, they may have organized for reasons of, of, of religious beliefs sometimes. Um, but the fact is they're organized, they're mobilized. And then once they face problems related to services, uh, related to access to the state, uh, they go out there and they use that same organization because they are a collective to demand these things. So that's one. What social movements also do, uh, both at the grassroots level as well as at, at a higher level, when they can become large and sometimes disruptive, is they wake up who they have elected uh, about their demands. And they also attract, they send a signal to different political parties that, look, we are organized, we, we have certain demands. And what is really interesting is that because they emphasize that, you know, that they are a political political parties are actually attracted to them even more. Um, and how do, they, how do they make a case to that then? They basically try and take on these demands. Over a period of time, social movements can actually increase competition for a constituency. And increased competition is always... Um, you just want to... Yeah. So, so you're saying that Community organizers are, are, are really not politicians in that sense. You had a very interesting team on community organizers. Yes, they are. They are so this is the interesting about community organizers. They want to be apolitical. They, for them, for their legitimacy, they, you know, they want to be close to the community. Uh, they want to be close to the demands of the community. This is, this is about being, what's, it's about maintaining a level of legitimacy within your own community. Now, that doesn't mean that when elections come around, they don't go out there and, you know, back and or sometimes endorse certain politicians. They may endorse a local leader and parties know how important these community leaders are. So they will reach out to these, uh, these entrepreneurs at the, at the grassroots level, asking them, for them, asking them for their support around elections. Uh, so yes, that is. Uh, so they 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 want to stay political, but come election time, they are drawn. They get drawn into it, to to politicking. So ethnic parties or the parties of Dalits have not delivered welfare. Maybe you know the most famous community organizer is probably Barack Obama. I mean, the, the Democratic Party has not delivered the welfare to the to the black community. Is this is this uh, surprising to you? No, it is. It, so, no, it isn't. Because in some ways, if you look at the US and, 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 and some of the, the problems that I, I highlight with block voting, especially among disadvantaged groups, uh, show up in both cases. Now, mind you, uh, Manish, both systems are different. This is a two party system. Um, in, in India and in many states, we have a multi party system, right? So, there are more choices. But the fact is, if you but if you go back to the questions that we're asking, is you know ninety percent the African of the African American vote goes to the Democratic Party. It's basically block voting. Now, if you look, if you if you if you if you are going to be voting behind one party, then the thing is, in at certain times and on certain demands, that party can take you for granted. Uh, they know that you have, they have your vote. They're not going anywhere. Uh, and so, you know, the leverage goes away. Um, and, and that sort of shows up with African-American politics and scholars have talked about it. Uh, and that, that shows up with BSP in Uttar Pradesh. Um, you know, so the other thing that, that also happens is if you take a long-term view uh, over, over multiple elections, you know, when you're behind one party, then elections are a lottery. 
If your party wins, you have access to the state, you have access to policies. If your party loses, uh, the other party is not going to be thinking about you or worrying about your concerns. So uh, in that sense, you know, this then, then block voting then becomes a disadvantage. So how do candidates from marginalized communities choose party? Or how do ethnic parties choose candidates? You, you've thought a little bit about that, would love to hear. Yeah, so, so ethnic parties, especially ethnic parties of marginalized groups, right? They, you know, they are, to begin with, they have constraints. And those constraints are of, you know, so let's just, you know, to begin with, it's a, these are, you know, parties of disadvantaged groups. There are resource constraints. Um, so as any ethnic party, as any party that is relying on a community, you want your community, but you also want support of other communities. So what do these parties do? They will pick candidates, maybe from another group sometimes, so that that candidate can draw some more voters from their own group. So that way you have your own group plus this other group that you start. So you use candidates to expand your coalition. You also use candidates as, as a party of disadvantaged groups to raise money. You want to get wealthy candidates who can spend money, uh, and who have resources and who can donate to the party. And then third, uh, which is uh, uh, a reality, ground reality in India, is you want to pick candidates who have some muscle. Uh, something that, you know, if you think about Millen's work, the first book that got the, the award, is that muscle matters because it can provide protection to, to voters uh, when it comes to uh, electoral campaigns in these in villages, when it comes to the day of voting. Um, and these, these things are, are important. So you want to get Bahubalis, you want to get people who have some muscle who can provide protect. They may not be from the community. They may not be from the same, they may not be from the same community, but the fact is that uh, they will they will help the party. So these are these are the different criteria that go into picking candidates for these parties. So, so can you another very interesting chapter in your book was on the marriage market, <laughs> or yes. just just intercaste marriages. So, can you give us a sense of that? That was just a fascinating chapter. So this comes out of a lot of out of you know a larger project that I have with with a colleague of mine, her name is Susan Osterman, and you know. And, and for me, the reason I got interested in looking at the marriage market is because ultimately my book is about Dalit politics and it's about, therefore, it looks at the reproduction of caste. How is caste reproduced in India? It's through marriage. Uh, it's, it's an, you know, jatis are endogamous groups uh, in it. And so ultimately, you know, you, know you, you cannot look at caste politics and you cannot look at mobilization of, of, of caste and not look at marriage. So that, you know, so they, I, I had to go there in that sense. Now, what, what we did was we, we worked with uh, matrimonial agencies. Uh, you know, there were these, you know, over, over the last decade and a half, uh, a lot of the marriage market has moved online. There are these online platforms. And what we did was we worked with matrimonial agencies to have, you know, find candidates who are very similar uh, in all attributes except their caste. And then we, you know, as, as is the case in uh, when even people uh, enter the marriage market, they provide their profiles and uh, then they look for marriage partners. Uh, you know, these candidates, these, these uh, prospective grooms, because we selected men um, and we sent out these profiles uh, through these uh, matrimonial, matrimonial agencies on different platforms uh, to uh, prospective brides of different, uh, different groups. Uh, different caste groups. Now, mind you, all of these people are actually in the marriage market. Uh, so, you know, so these are not like, these are not fake profiles. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I spoke to them, I asked them what their expectations were. And it was really interesting to see that essentially, you know, a lot of these people, you know, who we had, we, we, we worked with, were people who were very well educated, who all had a professional career. Uh, they came from the upper middle class section of Indian society, where one would imagine that caste didn't matter because people were educated, people had you know, left caste behind uh, in, in their urban, professional, educated profiles. And a lot of these, and, and these grooms actually had, all these grooms emphasized their professional caste, professional identity far more than their caste identity. But Manish, here's the thing. When these profiles went out and when we got the responses, caste mattered. 
people from upper caste, from the backward caste, got far more responses and were far more acceptable than those who were from Dalit Jatis. And, you know, the fact is, uh, they had the same attributes, they were the, almost the same height, they had the same income, same professional profile, education, job profiles, and yet caste matter. And sort of, it, it tells you that you can rise, you can, you know, and this is where sort of caste, the constraint of caste comes in, which is here are people, here are Dalits who have, you know, acquired a professional identity that, that they believe in, that matters to them, they see themselves through that identity, but society still sees them differently. And that, that's the point of the chapter, that identity is not just about how we see ourselves, but how others see us. And when you are from a marginalized, from a stigmatized group, you, you can still be stuck in an identity trap despite education, despite you know, uh, moving up or being upwardly mobile. Okay, so, so to sort of show, wrapping up here, what do you think Dalit politicians will catch up with Dalit community organizers? I mean, basically they're not as competent or not as this, or, 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 or they are playing a different game. So when somebody, I mean, they're playing, there's two planes taking off from two parallel runways, or will this Dalit social mobilization catch up with political mobilization or not really, you think? No, so I think I think Dalit social mobilization is ongoing. It is continuous, and it will continue. It will it will continue to increase across India. And I'll tell you why. Because see, you know, the scale of electoral politics in India, whether it's at the state assembly level or at the parliamentary level, is so huge. That's a really big task, right? To mobilize people at that level. Social mobilization in that sense is far more accessible. You don't need as many resources. The scale doesn't have to be that. So it is for, for a disadvantaged group, it's a more accessible form of organization. And I think over a period of time, as structural constraints go away, uh, you know, against mobilization, people will mobilize more. Now, uh, yes, these are two different games. Uh, social mobilization happens all the time. It's not episodic, uh, but elections come once every five years. So a lot of the electoral mobilization in India happens around elections. So these are two different games. As I said, the scale is different, but there is a big relationship here. And specifically, you're thinking about Dalit politicians and Dalit social mobilizers. Dalit social mobilizers, as their numbers increase, as you see Dalit uh, social movements becoming stronger, protest movements becoming stronger, even in, in states where Dalit parties are, are around and are, are electorally strong, the accountability of these parties to Dalits will begin to increase because of the voice that's being acquired at the ground level. So, the, so Dalit social mobilization will make Dalit politics stronger. It will also make Dalit representatives who are in other parties or parties, other parties who are interested in mobilizing Dalit, Dalits more accountable to Dalits. You know, because as I said, they are, they are, they add to accountability. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Your book, the, the field work, the writing, the research. I mean, it was just such an angle to conventional thinking that it's just absolutely an honor for us to have you as a joint winner of the prize. Thank you for staying up late to talk with us, Amit. And many congratulations. God, good luck and Godspeed with the very important work that you do. Thank you so much, Manish. I, again, I just want to thank everyone uh, on, on the jury for this prize. And I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate Jairam Ramesh, someone I've admired for such a long time as, as, my, as the co-winner of, of this prize. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, Jairam. Many congratulations. Thank you for, um, again, writing a wonderful book. We we've talked about your Huxer book in the past. And, and to me, this was as much a book about leadership and statecraft and the pursuit of power and so many other things that we've talked about. But it would really be helpful if you could just kick us off by saying, wh why, why is Mr. Menon an important person to write about? Well, I think the, the most important reason is from 1935 till 1962, he was the ideological soulmate of Jawaharlal Nehru. So to understand Nehru of uh, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s, 
uh, to understand his achievements, to understand his failures. Um, I think it's very important to get a fix on the Nehru Menon relationship. Uh, it was an intense intellectual relationship. Uh, I think Krishna Menon was perhaps uh, the only other man, other than Rajaji, uh, whom Nehru uh, considered to be an intellectual sort of superior to his. Uh, and uh, ideologically, they were very close. Uh, they were socialists. They were unrepentant socialists till the very end. They shared the same passions. Uh, they shared the same social networks in England. And Menon really uh, became the face of the Indian freedom movement in London. You see, most Indians, all of us think that our freedom movement was the product of a revolutionary struggle in India. That's very true. Uh, Gandhi led that revolution, which led us to freedom. But at the same time, there was another stream of our freedom movement, which was the negotiations between the Congress Party uh, and the British establishment, uh, the Labour Party mostly, uh, and different sections of British society uh, to make the idea of India free, respectable. Uh, and in that, I, Krishna Menon plays a very pivotal role. And therefore, to understand Krishna Menon, not just the Khalnayak of 1962, uh, but uh, the person who held the flag of India flying, uh, you know, through the India League, right through the 30s. Uh, I think it's one of the most important reasons why uh, this book needed to be written. So what, what were his strengths and weaknesses? Well, uh, it was extraordinarily bright. He was extraordinarily brilliant. Uh, he, he was known as Formula Menon right through the 1950s. When Kola required a solution, the Americans hated him, the Brits hated him, but they went to him. The Soviets hated him too, uh, but they went to him. And when there was a problem in Algeria, they went to him. Uh, when there was a problem on uh, American pilots being shot down over China, uh, the Americans and the Chinese uh, depended on him. So he formula men uh, the Suez uh, Canal, uh, the Indochina dispute in 1954. So Menon plays a very important role uh, in the resolution of international conflicts. Uh, this was the period of the 1950s uh, when India was did not count uh, very much internationally in terms of GDP or economic growth, but certainly counted hell of a lot intellectually, morally, and politically because of Gandhi and because of Nehru, and of course, because of the tradition of the freedom movement and all the great figures of the freedom movement, epitomized uh, by Gandhi and, and Nehru. So this was the period, the 50s was a period, the late 40s and the 50s was the period when India's voice counted. Uh, and Krishna Menon was India's voice. Remember, it's the voice of a blackie in a whitey world. Uh, you know, today we can, the world is very, very different. But the 50s was the world where the Anglo-Saxons ruled the roost. Uh, the Americans and the British uh, ruled the roost. And here was a white man, a black, dark man with a Savile Rose uh, three-piece suit, Mephistopheles, so to speak, uh, uh, but telling the Brits and the Americans where they got off, uh, spoke for the newly emerging, you know, colonial, uh, I, um, the, the anti-colonial uh, powers, um, the, the countries that were subject to colonial rule. So he becomes a very internationally known figure. And really from 1949 till 1962, he is the second most written about figure, the second most photographed figure, the second most lampoonized figure, <laughs> a cartoonized figure after Nehru. Um, and so, um, the other reason, Manish, which I, I want to stress why I wrote this book is because he left behind tens of thousands of papers, letters, notes, uh, suicidal notes, many suicide notes, for example, uh, many letters, many memos, um, just incredible amount of archival material uh, that he left behind that finally got open to scholars uh, February 2019. 
actually it got opened at the end of 2018 middle of 2018 <clears throat> but got cataloged later so uh, you know there's nothing better to write a biography than the availability of archival material for the first time uh, so uh, i wouldn't write a biography of anybody uh, where there is no primary material available you know where there is no archival material uh, and uh, that's what makes krishna menon in this generation of indian politicians uh, a unique personality so i know you've mentioned it many times that he shouldn't be remembered by 1962 and uh, was there was that a blind spot or was it just bad luck and bad circumstances or was there something in his personality uh, that was the weak spot well i Did think uh, you know um, he had a for manish uh, for resolving the border conflict uh, i mean he was formula man and if he didn't have a formula he wouldn't be formula man uh, and he had a formula uh, you know this was the formula of a swap deal we recognized we recognize uh, chinese um, uh, you know suzerainty if not sovereignty uh, on the western borders uh, and china recognize india's Uh, suzerainty if not sovereignty on the eastern borders uh, you know this has been called lee's deal it's been called a swap deal but there was uh, you know in the 50s from the late 50s onwards uh, he had been talking of a negotiated deal he was the only indian politician uh, in the 50s who talked about a negotiated settlement to the indian border uh, and uh, i'm afraid after 1958 Uh, that becomes increasingly impossible and untenable uh, nehru's cabinet is badly divided govind vallabh pant moraji desai sk patel uh, dead against any compromise uh, s radhakrishnan who was then vice president dead against any compromise with the chinese nehru himself uh, is in the period of his decline this is the autumn of the patriarch so to speak after 1958 he is not the great uh, you know force political force that he was in the 50s he is buffeted by the left and the right on both sides and parliament is dead against any settlement the media is against any settlement parliament is dead against any settlement not only the swatantra party not only the jansang but also the socialists so there is not a single voice saying that look this border is a dispute that needs to be settled through negotiations nobody other than menon uh, was taking this line and of course the most hard line critic of this line was a young member of parliament who had just been elected in 1957 uh, and uh, he was one of the most eloquent voices against a negotiated settlement uh, with china but when he becomes prime minister and he goes to beijing in 2003 uh, he signs an agreement with the chinese counterpart uh, which then starts the process of negotiations on the border i'm of course referring to mr vajpayee so in that in respect uh, krishna menon was more sinned against than sinning uh, you know had india uh, followed the krishna menon route of negotiations uh, had uh you know uh, had it been possible politically uh, to somehow manage a border settlement and i'm talking now of the period 58 59 uh, but after chavanlai's visit of april 1960 uh, comes virtually impossible and there are too many internal issues in china uh, which finally leads ma you know to to declare, to invade india uh, in october of 1962 uh, of course um, you know he he played favorites in the army uh, his choice of generals was singularly unfortunate um, and particularly in the choice of general bm call uh, you know who became the core commander uh, in uh, in nefa which then became arunachal pradesh um, so he did he did have his failings as defense minister but at the same time one has to uh, argue and i have tried to argue with primary evidence that if you are talking of make in india uh, it was krishna menon who was the original architect of make in india the migs were manufactured in india because of him 
the tanks were manufactured in India because of him, and DRDO, you know, which came into public prominence uh, with uh, Mr. Dr. Kalam, Abdul Kalam, was Krishnamanian's creation. So he was a, you know, deeply contradictory personality, Manish, you know, uh, he, he was his own worst enemy. Uh, he couldn't, uh, he, he not only could stand, not stand fools, he couldn't stand anybody else. Uh, and um, he was, uh, was extraordinarily appealing to women uh, and extraordinarily uh, suspicious of men, let me put it that way. <laughs> Except Nehru, of course, you know, because, you know, I think in Nehru we found uh, a soulmate and his ticket to political success. Uh, because had it not been for Nehru, uh, Krishna Menon would have been a footnote in Indian history. So I'll come, I want to talk a little bit about the craft of biography since you practice it so frequently and so well. But uh, even in your last book, the Huxer book and this book, you know, the themes of power, the themes of sort of leadership are, are, are really the most interesting parts for me personally. But, you know, for a diplomat, for a person whom you said the Americans ask for help, everybody asked for help, he was also, was he an easy person to get along with? He was very cantankerous, right? I mean, all of us who work in organizations, you have this guy who walks around with the resignation letter in his pocket. I mean, this guy kept resigning. I mean, these, these people, at some point you say, okay, give me your damn resignation, right? So, so he was, was he uh, get along with it? He was, he was cantankerous. Uh, and, but if he wanted uh, to get his job done, he would you turn on the charm to get his job done, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. He uh, he almost brought about rapprochement between America and China in 1955, for which Kissinger uh, is hailed, you know, uh, in 1971. But the politics of America in 1955 did not allow the American president uh, to uh, have this opening to China, and it was Christopher Menon who actually, you know, uh, led uh, opened the doors for a rapprochement between China and America, which finally took place uh, under Kissinger 16 years later. So if he wanted, if he wanted, uh, he could be very charming. He could, uh, as I said, he could be very constructive. Uh, and on numerous occasions, certainly the Korean conflict, uh, he is a very important player in the Korean conflict. Uh, he's a very important player in the solution that came about in 1954 for Cambodia, Laos, uh, and Vietnam and subsequently a large number of other issues uh, internationally. He was one of the first to call for uh, disarmament and the, which finally led to the partial test ban treaty of 1963. So yeah, he was, he was a diplomat without being diplomatic, you know? <laughs> he, 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 uh, you know, his style was different. I mean, it, was a, it was in your face style, uh, but you knew what you get, you, you know, uh, you knew what he stood for. Uh, and uh, he he had he had he was a Britisher in every respect, you know, deeply suspicious of the Americans, deeply suspicious of the Americans. Uh, uh, had I think he would have been preferable uh, Pax Britannica. Uh, he was certainly more comfortable than with Pax Americana. You know, he was certainly more comfortable with the idea of British supremacy in international politics. Uh, he negotiated with the Soviets. Uh, he was a left winger. He was a communist for a brief period of time between 1936 and 1939, when the British Communist Party supported Indian independence unreservedly. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, he was he was he was a deeply deeply split personality. I mean, he was not he was not somebody. Uh, you know, who had the graces of a diplomat. He, he said it as what he saw and what he believed. Uh, he won friends for us. Uh, he also won enemies for us, you know, a, a remarkable capacity. Uh, very popular man in America in the 50s, cover of Time magazine, uh, cover of, you know, Saturday Evening Post, cover of so many magazines, hated by the British uh, American establishment. And finally, of course, the American establishment gets him out uh, in October of 1962 as the prize for military assistance following the military debacle. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a remarkable life. 
but we should not forget the period of the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, that's when, you know, uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, Manish, something that is not generally known to people. Uh, today, everybody is reading the preamble to the Constitution of India. Uh, but the first draft of the preamble to the constitution was Krishnamenon's. Uh, and it was then sort of, you know, worked upon by various other people, uh, including Nehru, including Ambedkar, K.M. Munshi, and many others. But the first draft of the preamble actually came from Krishnamenon. Sovereign, independent, republic, uh, you know, came from Krishnamenon. Uh, and also, uh, way before the preamble, Way back in 1934, he was amongst the first Indians to call for a constituent assembly to frame a constitu constitution for a free India. Uh, Gandhi himself was deeply suspicious uh, of a constituent assembly. And Gandhi uh, makes up his mind for a constituent assembly only by 1939. But the first man to actually uh, advocate uh, a constituent assembly was Krishna Menon. And this was largely because of the influence of Harold Lasky, uh, whose student he was uh, at the London School of Economics. And we know that the constituent assembly met, you know, for three years, for almost two and a half years, beginning December 1946, and finally resulted in the constitution of India. So let me, before we wrap up, we're running out of time, is I want to ask you on the craft of biography because you. you you're, you're a great practitioner of it. And you, a large part of this book is built on letters between him and his sisters, between him and Nehru, between him and people don't write letters anymore. So how is, how is this going to work in the future? Yeah, I mean, if somebody were to write the biography of a current day political leader, they'll have to look at tweets, they'll have to look at WhatsApps, uh, they'll have to look at emails. You're right, that generation political leaders in India, particularly, uh, you know, who leave behind uh, written material for biographers, uh, very, very few. I, I can't think of anybody, frankly. There's really nobody. Uh, it's very difficult. You know, I can't even think of Dr. Manmohan Singh, really, you know, the most erudite and the most educated, the prime ministers we have had, whether there is a lot of primary archival material uh, that, you know, he, he would have. Uh, in terms of his letters and memos and notes and so on. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is a, this is a difficult call for, uh, for biographers, you know. Uh, it's very difficult to get uh, the primary. I mean, for example, you can't do a biography of Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee based on archival evidence, you know. There's hardly any archival material. Uh, so you have to talk to people, you have to, you have to go through old newspapers, uh, you have to interview a lot of people, so there is a there is a you know there's a problem in, with with writing biographies in India so particularly. If you were, so if you, uh, if you, written people, tradition is not very strong in public life. So the next question is is in how does a politician write a biography of a politician, especially a politician who belongs to the same party, without how do you remove yourself and your thoughts and your history and your yourself from the equation? It was only possible because there were letters, right? Yes, it's possible because there is written evidence. Uh, and, you know, you can't, you can't fight with the written evidence. You really can't fight. I mean, uh, you know, there's a letter. Uh, there's a letter, for example, from Nehru uh, to Krishna Menon in uh, late 1939, saying that I'm having a, I've, I've had a physical breakdown. Now I'm, I'm having, going through an intense mental crisis. Uh, you know, I, I'm having a mental collapse. Uh, I'm sure I'll come out of it, uh, but I see darkness around me. Uh, and this letter is there in the archives. Uh, should I use it? Should I not use it? I would not be true to myself if I had not used it. And once having used it, I have to figure out why Nehru writes what he wrote. Uh, and the reason why he wrote is because he was deeply, deep opposed to the marriage of uh, his daughter. Uh, to Feroz Gandhi. Uh, he was very fond of Feroz Gandhi, uh, but as a son-in-law, uh, you know, he was unaccepting of him. And that's what created this tension in his mind. And this is what I, you know, I had to decide, do I want to write this in the book or don't I want to write in this book? Uh, and for me, it was a no-brainer. I included it in the book because if I hadn't, 
I was not being a biographer. I was not being true to myself. I was not being an honest biographer. Yes. You know, both these books to me are really representative of why India is not yet, I mean, India may not be the most powerful and most important country in the world, but it has strong claims to be one of the most interesting countries in the world. And we thank you both for your writing. We, we congratulate you on the prize. It is an honor for the New India Foundation and obviously the Bangalore Lit Fest to have both of you here and, and many congratulations and much gratitude for your writing. We look forward to your next round of work. Just the last question before I close, is there a, both of, for both of you, is there a book in the works or is it, are you still thinking? So Amit? Well, there is. Okay. Please, please, uh, Mr. Ramesh, please go ahead. Go ahead, Jairam. Well, um, uh, Manish, my book, the next book is going to be out sometime, you know, in the middle of uh, 2021. And it's a completely different book. Uh, it's a biography, not of an individual, but it's of a biography of a poem. Uh, the poem is called The Light of Asia. It was published in 1879. Uh, and it's a poem that uh, has profoundly influenced our thinking of the life of Buddha. So it's a biography of that poem, why that poem became so influential, how it influenced Gandhi, how it influenced Tagore, how it influenced Nehru, how it influenced Ambedkar, uh, and you know how it got translated into so many Indian languages, got made into a film. So it's not a biography of a, uh, of a person, but this is a biography of a book. So. I, it's, a, it's an experiment I'm trying. Wow. Amit? So yes, uh, th so there is well, there's a book that's in the works. It's uh, and you know like like this this book. Uh, it's involved lots and lots of research, and that's that book uh, will look at uh, the Indian military, but in a larger context, uh, especially on how the Indian military makes diversity work. And so that's my that's my next big project. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Bangalore Lit Fest, for hosting us. Many congratulations to the winners again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.